Hello, everybody. Um, we're going to give people just a few more minutes to enter into the presentation room and then we'll get started. Welcome everybody. My name is Elizabeth Kozlowski and I'm the editor of Surface Design Journal, which is the quarterly publication of Surface Design Association. Um, SDA is a membership nonprofit dedicated to contemporary fiber and textile art. And we are thrilled to partner with um, the International Quilt Museum, the Quilt Alliance, and the Studio Art Quilt Associates to share these textile talk webinar series with you. So the focus of today's event, our winter 2023 journal, Seeing Being Seen, with guest editor Rebecca Frank, um, was supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, to find out more about how um, NEA Arts Grants um, impact individuals and communities, you can visit www.arts.gov. So first I wanna go through a few housekeeping announcements. So this is a webinar. Your screens and mics are not active or showing. Um, we always welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of all of the presentations. Um, you can submit them in the Q&A box located on the bottom of your screen. Um, please remember to use the Q&A box and not the chat because we monitor those um, for the Q&A session. So we are honored to bring you these three in inspiring textile talks and we respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators and other participants. Um, and keep in mind that your chat comments can be seen by everyone. If you prefer not to see notifications from the chat, you can click on the chat button to toggle them on or off. So today we celebrate SDA's winter journal, Seeing Being Seen, LGBTQIA writers on LGBTQIA plus fiber artists. So guest editor Rebecca Frank will be joined in conversation by featured writer Tia Roberts and Kate O'Connell Richards as we delve into the complexity of intersectional identity and how it informs creative practices in fiber. So in this issue in particular, it highlights the significant impact LGBTQIA plus artists have in deconstructing craft binaries. These include masculine, feminine, high, low, functional, decorative, and of course, art and craft. And to quote Rebecca, we offer an invitation to see and be seen in all our complexity. So I'm really excited to introduce our guest editor for this issue today, Rebecca Frank. Um, she received her MFA in jewelry and metalsmithing from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2012, and a BFA in jewelry and metalsmithing from Texas State University in 2010. Her chosen material is steel, a fascination discovered through a challenge received when she was 18. So her creative practice has focused on that material ever since, working as a blacksmith, a welder, a machinist, and currently a jeweler and metalsmith. Um, Rebecca explores themes of protection, vulnerability, and boundaries in her work. 
In 2024, she'll participate in the Craft Art Lab in Austria. So in addition to her art practice, Rebecca writes about artists whose work has a strong material focus. As a queer artist herself, she specifically enjoys writing about other queer artists to celebrate their experiences and processes. Her articles have been published not only in Surface Design, but also on Art Journey Forum, Metalsmith Magazine, American Craft, as well as international exhibition catalogs for museums and galleries. Rebecca is also the Art and Craft Program Officer at the Maxwell Harahan Foundation. So I'm really excited to have you here and introduce you today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really uh, impressed by the amount of um, um, shared kind of sharing of this event. So it's crossing into multiple um, organizations, which is really cool to see. Um, so I'm first just going to do some some basic introductions. Um, first, I don't know how big I am on your screen. Um, I'm a white freckled person wearing round glasses and I have reddish brown hair that kind of goes to my chin and I'm wearing four layers of black shirts and I have um, a plant that's kind of blurred out in my background and I'm coming to you from San Francisco which is a pretty amazing place to be gay honestly um, it's it's a really welcoming place and it's got a lot of layers of history here starting with the Ramatesh Ohlone people who are the ancestral uh, holders of this land um, and it's also uh, just Interestingly, it has an American Indian cultural dis district, which is a few blocks from my house, and a um, transgender cultural district, which is down the street. So that's a pretty interesting fact about the location. Um, if my slideshow could begin. I can't see it yet. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Karina. All right, next slide, please. So you might be wondering how a metal worker, artist, person came to be the editor of a textile magazine. And Elizabeth shared a little bit about that, but just I'll tell you a little bit about my work. I work with steel and specifically making jewelry right now. Um, it's a little bit like crocheting the way I work. I create these chains of interlocking links and the way that they interact with gravity and the body is really different. They're abstract, they're minimal, um, the way that they look on the wall and the way that they look on the body is very, very different. Um, on the wall, they're kind of quiet and meditative and still, and on the body, they're playful and they kind of dance around the body and move differently. Next slide. Um, Elizabeth mentioned I'm also a writer, so I started uh, writing about artists that I wanted to see in the magazines that I was looking at. And I am kind of um, process and material agnostic. I enjoy looking for things that excite me, whether it's a texture or a process. And I'm not a critic or a um, um, curator or, or that kind of mind. I mostly love writing about artists because I get the opportunity to sit down and talk to them, learn about their practice, ask them, you know, weird, dorky material process questions and kind of be inspired by them. And I focus on queer artists because that's a point of connection across the materials, across the different kinds of, of making, across the different ways of being in the world. So of the eight artists that you see on this slide, only one of them is not queer. Uh, and that's Tatiana Aprez, who I wrote about, um, I think that was my first article for surface design. And she's a Colombian artist working with indigenous processes. Um, so I, I hope you can see, but the breadth of uh, people I've written about, Carson Terry is a blacksmith, um, Erica Diamond does uh, amazing work in textiles using uh, Kevlar as protective garments for queer people. Craig Calderwood uses upholstery fabric and puffy paint, another artist that I wrote about for Surface Design Journal. Hollis Chito does traditional beadwork, but um, touches on really um, uh, current uh, issues on the reservations, specifically how HIV and AIDS is still affecting people in that community. 
um, let's see, Erica, or not Erica, um, Hector Garcia is going to be in a feature in the next issue of Metalsmith, and he's a Mexican American artist who crochets with copper. So, yes, this is a textile community. Uh, be sure to check that out. Next slide. So I also did a really huge uh, project called Queer Metals that was originated at, from a residency I did at a digital residency that I did in the UK. So I never actually and still have not been to the UK. Um, and I was able to use a survey to engage 120 queer metal workers from around the world and wrote an article and then there was an exhibition. So that's kind of how I came to be the guest editor of Surface Design Journal besides the writing, but also this kind of really large project. Um, and I was really grateful for the invitation. Next slide. So the project summary um, is I wanted to feature makers in the textile space who identified as queer and all the letters and don't exist um, and recognizing that they don't exist as a singular community. And instead, you know, queer people's lives include a lot of other parts of themselves. Um, they everything interrelates and just knowing somebody is queer, you only know a tiny little part of who they are, but everything interrelates and connects and overlaps and is intriguing and is, you know, everybody has these things and it kind of makes us who we are. Next slide. So back in 2022, when I first received the invitation to consider this, um, I had been influenced by a lecture I attended by Aruna D'Souza, and it was about the title of the lecture was about opacity, and it's at the National Gallery. And she talked about um, Edouard uh, Glissant, who I have just dipped my toe in this amazing person's um, theories and concepts. It's like I kind of opened the door and peeked in. Um, but so his book, po Poetics of Relation, and one of the, the things that I found interesting about this was, was the ability to hold, that, for, that people have to hold multiple identities at once. And we kind of know this is true, but it it's becomes difficult as we like to quantify and categorize people and put them in little boxes. Next slide. So some of the concepts that I kind of pulled from this, um, uh, was that you know people have multiple identities that relate and they don't merge you know you can be a metalsmith or a textile artist and gay and living in a rural place and black and you know upper class you know you can be all these different kinds of identities that touch different ways of moving into the world and they all mean something and then they all kind of merge together in this beautiful way but they don't disappear right they kind of hold themselves so these identities exist in relation to each other, but they don't overpower or supersede each other. And understanding isn't necessary to allow existence. So, you know, like you don't have to understand somebody's multiple facets. Um, that's, a, that's a metalsmithing reference, sorry. And, um, to kind of allow and accept that, that they exist, you know, um, which is kind of relevant considering in the queer context or the legislation against trans people right now and um, also the way that people are trying to erase different kinds of history from our education um, and schools and spaces like that next slide so as the editor you know i'd never done this before uh, so it was kind of interesting to learn the process of, of what it meant to be an editor it was almost two years that i worked on this project with elizabeth and everybody at surface design association so the you know, first step was uh, to invite and promote to a wide, wide range of people using the textile network and my network um, to try and bring in new voices and different ways of making. One of the reasons I appreciate Surface Design Journal is that it is uh, really inclusive. Like I first heard about it years and years ago, I think in the 90s, because a jewelry person was on the cover, you know, so it grabbed my eye and I believe it was April Wood. Um, so that overlapping network kind of brings more people into the, the conversation. I wanted to focus on a variety of overlapping perspectives and identities. So that was a huge part of the selection process, right? Like how did these individuals get selected? So making sure that there was different 
people people coming from different countries, different time of life, different um, demographics, different uh, queer identities. I also wanted to be, as a metal worker, kind of new to the textile space, inclusive of different material processes, because, you know, I'm not from your world, so it's pretty exciting to see all the different ways that textile is used as a creative practice and a traditional practice and everything in between. Um, there is a, a preference for new writers and artists to service design um, association and journals. So we kind of looked at past issues and tried um, to bring new uh, makers and new writers um, and with the hope that maybe these writer, writers will continue to submit and and hopefully tantalize the readers with new makers into um, in this issue. And then in part of my practice, I the writing part of my practice, there's there's this complexity. I said I wasn't a critic. Um, and I think the voice of artists is really important, and especially when they're talking about their kind of perspective and making. So I wanted to feature the voice of the artist more. So I think this issue is weighted more heavily towards um, in the studio, which is the, the artist's voice. And we had five of those. It was a really great way to include different um, types of people talking about their practice and their identity from a first person space. Next slide. So that's it. Um, I really love the cover. I'm a, a, a black and gray kind of person, so I really appreciate the starkness of that image. Um, so that's that's it for me. I really look forward to the questions and being in conversation with the two amazing contributors and Elizabeth. So I will pass it back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for sharing both your inspirations and your thought process for this really important issue. And um, something I think you said brilliantly about the choices, not only for this issue, but for, for how we approach the journal in general, which is understanding isn't necessary to allow existence. So you don't necessarily have to come from a fiber background in order to develop something like this, um, because all ex um, perspectives are important. So with that, I'm really excited to introduce our next presenter today, um, Kate O'Connell Richards. They are an artist, broom squire, an educator currently living in Madison, Wisconsin. O'Connell Richards has exhibited inter internationally and shown work at the Massachusetts Museum of Con Contemporary Art in North Adams, Massachusetts. Um, their last solo exhibition, Swept, was held at Hancock Shaker Village in Pittsburgh, Massachusetts in 2022. So they have been awarded several travel grants for craft research, including a 2024 craft research fund project grant to study the history of American broom making. Their writing has been published by Surface Design Journal and Marigold Magazine, and currently they are a lecturer for UW-Madison Art Department. So i um, really excited to welcome you today, Kate. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, waiting for my slides to get up, and then we'll get started. Um, I am uh, coming to you from Madison, Wisconsin. I am a white person with long wavy brown hair, large brass ear weights and a black bandana around my neck. Um, I am, as, as Elizabeth said, I am a artist, an educator, a broom squire and a jeweler. Um, I won't be focusing on being an educator or a jeweler so much in this presentation, though they're quite influential to my work. Um, in this short talk, I'll be uh, talking generally about my work and how I arrived at my research in relation to my article, Approachable and Reproachable Brooms, uh, in this latest issue of Surface Design Journal. Next slide. I have a real love of things and uh, refer to myself as a craft-informed artist, um, a term I give credit to my, my friend and fellow metalsmith Eleanor Rose for coining. I'm not really interested in the classification of my works as craft or art in a sort of rejection of those binaries, which is something I tend to do. <laughs> uh, my sculptural works match together many different craft media and practices. You can see that with this piece here, Axis Mundi. I wove those ribbons. Um, there's wood, there's copper. I did a little bit of blacksmithing and more. 
Um, I specifically look at ways in which classic tools of labor, both agricultural and domestic, and tools of spirituality meet. For example, I was looking at maypoles uh, with this piece here. You know, tools like pitchforks, sickles, distaffs have been ascribed different qualities by those in power throughout history, powers of a magical or malevolent nature. Um, and I'm also really interested in labor history, particularly in the U.S. Next slide. I grew up in Kansas, and um, I saw at least one person from Kansas in the chat, <laughs> um, and spent a lot of time surrounded by seemingly fallow fields and abandoned buildings where I would party with friends and take pictures or just technically trespass upon out of curiosity. Um, there in these, in these abandoned barns, uh, I saw mounds of rusty tools laying out, and they elicited such a curiosity in me, which has really never left. They seemed like magical relics. Um, I really enjoy the work of Timothy Morton, and, and they said that objects, quote, are portals uh, connecting past, present, and future fantasy. And in this spirit, sometimes I think I'm making very specific LARPing objects for a time and place that only exists in my head. I wish to elicit that, um, that sense of curiosity and wonder in my audience, as I know the love of objects, the arcane, and the old is not uncommon. I enjoy being able to have my work start conversations, firstly about the objects themselves, then about the practice of making them, then their history, which can uh, lead to imagining potential futures as I tie that history to the present. We know that historical romanticism is a double-edged sword of both harmful forgetting and also inspiration for forming new ways of thinking. Next slide. I was very fortunate uh, in 2017 to be admitted to UW-Madison's MFA program, and there I had resources, all the resources that a Research One institution can provide available to me, uh, the likes of which I've never had before. And um, while there, I worked with members of the folklore department um, and learned fieldwork practices while traveling with them up to the UP, the Upper Peninsula, to study the, the copper mining culture of the area. I began doing field work um, on my own and object study on my own. I grew up in a family of archivists, historians, and librarians, so this act felt very familiar. Uh, this is a piece I made not too long after that trip to the UP. I looked at um, pre-electric miners' helmets, and they had these wonderful uh, objects called sticking Tommies, where they would literally suspend a light bulb on their forehead, or excuse me, <laughs> a candle instead of a light bulb on their forehead. Next slide. So here's some images from my field work. We have an image from the Shaker Museum uh, in Old Chatham, New York, and then Old Sturbridge Village in Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, by the way, uh, the Religious Society of the Shakers are very important to my research as they're often credited with major broom developments. Uh, they were a fringe religious society. They still exist today. There's less than 10 of them up in, up in Maine, um, but there's a lot of images of Shaker sites um, in this presentation. Uh, the broom was very important to their uh, to their communities as cleanliness was as to God godliness. Um, several years ago, my work started to become a lot more personal. Uh, while I still looked at historic objects, uh, the resulting pieces were declarations of the alienation and shame I sometimes felt as uh, throughout my life as a queer person and artist. This image of um, a mop from the Shaker Museum. Uh, the Shakers, like many others, would make mops out of old textiles uh, just to give them new life. I made my own piece called Mopped, which is my old bed sheets um, after a failed relationship. So the remnants of myself, this other person, guilt, and that relationship um, are on these repurposed textiles. Next slide, please. The tools I look at are associated both with traditionally masculine and traditionally feminine labor. I always like to say, you know, some people like to focus in on my candle making as a traditionally a, a women's craft, but I like to say that I make the candles, but I also make the candlesticks too. <laughs> um, an, an artist I exhibited with recently referred to my works as as touchstones to a fantastical place, and I don't think I've ever gotten such a such a compliment from another artist. It meant a lot. Uh, next slide, please. So broom making, uh, I learned broom making at Foxfire Center for Appalachian Craft in, um, in Heritage in 2019 under the broom maker Carol Morse. In the US, there are two major hotspots for brooms and those are New England and Appalachia. Um, I began integrating um, these broom making techniques into my sculptural pieces. This is my piece, Distaffectionate. And it's nice to present to a lot of textile people because you may all know what a distaff is already, but for those who don't, it is an earlier form of spinning using gravity. 
And in this image um, from Hans Holbein the Younger, we see a woman or witch um, using a distaff it, like a broom and several other objects was this um, elongated object associated with witchcraft and per perversion. And here's some more images of that. Those uh, 16th century printmakers really did like images of, of witches and their tools. Uh, here we see these artistic renderings of the magical and malevolent broom and others. There's a distaff in the famous Durer piece, um, The Witch. Um, and then cooking forks on the far right, Baldung piece. Um, you know, the broom to me is a really exemplary object to look at. Uh, of, it wraps up all my interests nicely with a little bow almost. It's a tool of labor. It has been ascribed to magical powers. And while it's often declared a tool solely of women, I would argue it's pretty queer. It's a false phallus, a weapon, and an excellent object to trace the history of colonial expansion, agriculture, and labor in the U.S. Next slide, please. I'm even after these few short years of research, I'm always stunned at where the broom leads me. Um, it's totally ubiquitous, but it's not humble, which is a word that I often hear with it. Um, so many issues of contemporary life, labor, agricultural mass production, late capitalism, NAFTA, contemporary homesteading, gender. These are all things that the broom can be a useful tool to make commentary on. I also, coming from the jewelry uh, community, I don't hear the word master thrown a lot around with broom making. Uh, the idea of mastery has always made me unsettled from the word itself and its historical connotations to its spurious definitions, um, to the upholding of a particularly limited kind of beauty when it's deployed at its worst. I just don't see that in broom making too much. Next slide, please. So here's some more images from field work. Um, I've done a lot of traveling uh, to important sites in New York. There's the Shaker Museum, again, really beautiful layout of, of original brooms. The Hadley Farm Museum in Hadley, Massachusetts, where Levi Dickinson, who is a, a character um, in broom history, first uh, started a um, enterprise growing brooms, uh, broom corn for brooms, along with the Shakers. And then Victor Trading Company in Colorado, um, the 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 business of Sam and Karen Morrison, who are very cool uh, broom makers, and they have this amassed collection of brooms on their wall. Next slide. At these spots I travel to, I often work with curators. I visit their collections, their libraries and archives. And as I am a maker, the study of these objects is incredibly fun. And so we can have some images here from Old Sturbridge Village and Hancock Shaker Village, some really wonderful table, table whisks and brushes there, as well as some woven brooms. Next slide. Um, in addition to all this travel, I also take oral histories and interview makers about their lives, their mentors, techniques, and stories. This is Faith Deering, who is a broom maker at Historic Pittsfield. Um, there's a strong oral tradition in broom making. There's very little how-to. Um, there's multiple names uh, that are, you know, regionally coded um, that could all describe a very similar technique. And so I really, um, you know, we depend on people who have been doing this for a long time, and uh, I want to save that, uh, that knowledge. Um, I was uh, recently awarded a travel grant from the Center for Craft, um, and I'm very thankful for that. And um, so there's going to be a lot more writing in the next um, next couple of years. I just came back from visiting Berea College's student craft program. They have a, a large broom craft studio uh, there where I was a visiting artist for a couple of weeks. Uh, next slide. Uh, the first incarnation, as mentioned in my bio, um, of this research was through this solo show, Swept, which was at Hancock Shaker Village. There's a lot of repeated uh, folkloric anecdotes about brooms that certain individuals like Ben Franklin are responsible for uh, these major points of invention. But throughout my research, um, I found that the truth is likely a lot more complex and beautiful. Uh, broom making and the history of it is an amalgamation of uh, human invention. Um, Shakers had an image of a utopia uh, on Earth, which I relate to contemporary ideas of a queer utopia and my own personal feelings about art and self-betterment. That is, it is a process with no concrete end. I really love to share this quote by Eduardo Galeano. Uh, utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps closer. It moves two steps further away. I walk another 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps further away. As much as I may walk, I never reach it. So what's the point of utopia? The point is to keep walking. Next slide. You can currently catch my work in the group show Like Magic, uh, curated by the wonderful Alexandra Ferradas at Mass MoCA. 
Um, not only is this a really beautiful show, and I feel very honored to show alongside um, the other artists that are in it, but uh, Massachusetts has been probably the number one state where I've done most of my research. And so to be able to represent the results of some of that research there has been very meaningful. Next slide. So speaking about research and writing, let's end up where we end up, which is my article in this uh, recent edition of Surface Design Journal, uh, Approachable and Reproachable Brooms, A Visit to Wyoming Territorial Prison uh, Broommaking and Prison Labor. Um, this article is all about my visit to the Wyoming Territorial Prison in Laramie last summer. Um, it was a prison that ran for a short span, a couple decades in the uh, late, 19, or late 20th um, century up until about, I think, 1917. Um, I'm interested in uh, art being used as a tool for social instigation and change, um, especially through objects. And um, I enjoy articulating and contextualizing relationships between past and contemporary life, which is, I found that to be writing to be a really good venue for making those very direct comp um, connections. And the Wyoming Territorial Prison, um, they used broom making um, as a way to quell uh, the broom makers and also make profit for uh, those who ran the prison. Um, it, and in this article, I kind of break that down, the prison's history, and also give other examples of broom making being used, because this isn't the only time that broom making um, has been an activity for um, incarcerated labor. You know, I really love how this article fit into the the message of this entire issue because the broom is often an unseen object and I thought about unseen labor and uh, you know ironically enough unseen labor usually makes unseen objects and that is still true today in uh, 2022 some of our most ubiquitous objects like the brooms are still being produced by prison labor drywall um, mattresses food products um, in it, I reference a study by the ACLU and the Vera Institute giving um, really, really dark statistics on the state of prison labor today. Uh, the incarcerated are forced to work and are making less than a dollar an hour. And of course, attempts to unionize um, are quashed really quickly. Um, I also have a list on my Instagram of uh, good resources if you're interested in reading into this topic further. Um, so, you know, in the spirit of things being seen and unseen um, in terms of queerness, I wanted to write about that, but also about uh, the seen and unseen types of labor. And I'm very thankful that it ended up um, in this issue. And um, next slide. Uh, that's all for me. Um, there's all my my contact information on there. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. For me, I think your work um, is really thoughtful and uh, demonstrates some um, really interesting and new ways of thinking about our world through objects such as the broom. Um, so I'd like to introduce our last presenter for the day. Um, Kate, when you have a chance, can you um, turn off your video? Thank you so much. And then, um, Tia, when you have time, you can join me in introductions. So Tia Amoy Roberts is an artist whose work focuses on racialized gender and its relationship to art making, community building, and selfhood. So their artistic practice includes the mediums of writing, music, and fiber art. Um, Tia recently graduated from Stanford U University in 2023 with honors in the African and African American Studies program. Um, Tia also has a minor in political science. Um, they are currently the alumni fellow at the Queer Student Resource Center and as well as assistant to the chief curator at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. So please welcome uh, Tia. Hi everyone, um, we could go ahead and, okay, great. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, hello everyone. I hope um, that the day is treating you well. Uh, my name is Tia Amoy Roberts. I use they, them pronouns. Um, today we'll be talking about self-fashioning through textiles. More specifically, what does it mean to understand oneself through textile art? Um, what does it mean to understand one's community through art? 
Um, these aren't questions that we'll answer today, most likely, um, but we'll try to get an understanding of how myself and Alexander Hernandez, who is the subject of the article I wrote for the Surface Design Journal, um, work toward those answers. Next slide. Okay. Um, a little bit about me. Like I said, my name is Tia. Um, I use any pronouns, but chiefly they, them pronouns. I'm originally from South Florida, Broward County specifically, if there's any Broward County in the chat, which I totally doubt, but like, let me know. Um, I moved to the Bay Area for school. Like I said, I went to Stanford um, and kind of stayed the whole time. Um, and continued after graduation to stay. Um, I now work at Stanford University at the Career Student Resource Center as an alum fellow and um, also working at uh, the Museum of the African Diaspora. Um, I, getting into museums is actually how I came about um, being able to contribute this article, um, but I'll get into that in like a couple of seconds. But yeah, um, so I majored in African and African American studies and political science, um, and I did my undergrad thesis on um, music making and selfhood, um, specifically how Black queer music making and self-fashioning, um, what, what it means to like hold that identity in the music space that is so centered around um, performance um, and kind of understanding gender itself as a performance and seeing how that moves through performing gender in a performance space. Um, and in that same vein, I want to use this opportunity to, to ponder art and performance in the realm of textile art. Um, I worked at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco this summer, um, and my manager, Abram um, Jackson, was kind enough to introduce me to Jonathan Carver Moore um, at the Jonathan Carver Moore Gallery. For those who are in um, SF now, um, and have been to the Tenderloin or haven't been to the Tenderloin yet, I would highly, highly recommend Jonathan Carver Moore Gallery. Um, but I formed um, a great mentorship relationship with Jonathan Carver Moore, and he actually recommended me for this article. Um, and so I'm very grateful to have been able to meet Alex Hernandez through this um, and share his work with you a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but it was a wonderful opportunity for me who was just graduating and wasn't sure exactly um, where or when I would land my uh, first full-time job. Um, it was nice to have a little freelancing cushion, um, super helpful. And like I said, it gave me a chance to explore another textile artist. Um, this photo that I have up here is actually of my um, small crochet business. Um, I started crocheting when I was maybe like nine years old. Um, and just kind of kept on doing it. It was more like a process thing for me. I just kind of was interested in how the stitches worked um, and how to, yeah, you could get from like a ball of yarn, a ball of yarn to like an actual thing that you can hold, like a coaster. My grandma makes crochet blankets. Um, and so it was something that I was kind of always exposed to. Um, but I didn't make crochet clothing until I was maybe 16. Um, and Funnily enough, that's around the time that I like came out as as queer in high school. Um, and as I got older and like went off to college, um, I found myself using crochet to explore my gender expression a little bit more, um, kind of thinking about like what clothes that I was comfortable in and not exactly being able to find that just like ready-made in a store um, and wondering like if I could make something that made me feel good about myself, um, myself. Um, so for me, textile art was always kind of as an extension of myself. Um, and I think that um, it helped me understand who I am as a gender non-conforming person, um, which, was, which was and continues to be very exciting. Um, and this photo is from my first pop-up shop that was in 2022. Um, and in a couple of weeks, I'll be doing that same pop-up shop, um, and reopening my store, which I've had closed since I graduated. So that's very exciting news. Um, but yeah, we can move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about Alexander Hernandez, who is a multimedia textile artist. He was born in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, lived a little bit in San Diego before spending most of his life in Grand Junction, Colorado. 
um and he's currently based in San Francisco um Alexander always understood himself as a queer person um going from being a painter in middle and high school um, to moving on to sewing in college. He told me a story about mentioning to his mom while he was um, sometime maybe in elementary school that he wanted to uh, pick up sewing, try a sewing machine, and she told him that it was for girls. So he put it off until college, but um, eventually that passion found him. Um, Growing up in Grand Junction, Colorado was difficult for Alex. Um, not only as a queer person, but as a queer person of color. Um, He saw almost no one like him. There were almost no Mexican people in his area and certainly not any queer folks, certainly not any queer folks of color who enjoyed art. Um, So he kind of found his identity um, and settled into his identity as like the token um, queer kid, the token person of color, like really settling into being different, um, which... I feel like when you are going to these um, schools that are where the majority of people are not like you, you could either uh, reject (laughs) that you're not like them or accept it. And he chose to embrace it. Um, And so that's something I found really inspiring in our conversation. Um, And not only did his uh, queer identity challenge him, but um, as he grew older and went off to college, still in Colorado, um, coming to understand himself as an HIV positive person also challenged um, his uh, understanding of himself and his positionality in his um, small Colorado town. Um, Just as he became aware of his status, however, he was accepted into an MFA program in San Francisco, which brought him into a queer community that he'd always been searching for. Um, His textile work explores queerness, memory, loss, and especially the loss of connection that we all experienced during COVID lockdown. Um, He has some great work on um, portraits he's made of HIV positive icons. Um, I'm not going to show those today, but you can look them up. They are amazing. Um, But I wanted to get into more his uh, starting out in textiles and then moving into the work that he did during the pandemic. Um, So we can go over to the next slide. Okay, so um, this work is called Always Thinking About Yesterday. He made it in 2021. Um, It's interesting because Alex was talking to me about um, how he started out in textile work. Um, Like I said, he was in college. He kind of had this complex about wanting to sew, but he decided to full send himself into it. Um, Similar to myself, Alex came from a low income background um, and especially being a college kid, he couldn't exactly afford to go like to a craft store and pick up fabrics for when he wanted to practice or do assignments. And so instead he went to like the local thrift shop and um, picked up whatever he could find, um, scrap blankets, pillowcases, things like that. Um, And he found himself really being drawn to um, fabrics that reminded him of his home, that reminded him of like tablecloths that would show up in his house, reminded him of curtains. Um, And so he found that the pieces he made so deeply deeply invoked memory for him. um, And he believed that this specific form of textile work where you're going into a thrift store and picking out what you can um, posed this like unique and exciting challenge because the fabrics had to tell him what to make rather than him going in um, with an idea. And I thought that was so interesting and different from the way that like crocheting works for me, for example, um, because it kind of feels like a blank slate. Like you just have this piece of, yarn that you can do anything to um, rather than um, fabric that already had its purpose, already has um, a pattern um, and you kind of being led by it um, to to create something. So always thinking about yesterday um, was a a piece that really represented memory for him um, and a lot of fabrics that reminded him of home and homemaking. Next slide. Okay, these two pieces um, were both uh, related to 
um, lockdown. So this first piece on the left, hide and seek, um, contains not only um, quilting, but soft sculpture. And um, a lot of his soft sculpture work is meant to be touched and intended to allow the feeling of a cuddle or connection during a time of disconnectedness. He actually had um, an installation God, I don't remember where the museum was now, but um, that you could actually like lay down with little like legs and arms um, that was supposed to, yeah, invoke that feeling of touch and connectedness that we'd, that we'd lost so much of um, during lockdown. And um, if you can see in both of these pieces, he used a lot of like children's sleeping bags. You can see that there's like Rugrats characters in there and like um, there are uh, Care Bears in Nothing Is Like Yesterday. Um, and the sleeping bags reminded him of being a kid. Um, he made them as he sat in his childhood bedroom um, during the pandemic. And as everything changed around him, he was looking to invoke a feeling of comfort, a feeling of memory. Um, and these methods of storytelling through art that aren't exactly meant to invoke a message or a prose, but rather meant to invoke a collective feeling are something that I feel like is a common thread in a lot of queer art making. Um, because the, the idea of storytelling in a nonlinear way is, um, I feel like, evocative of something um, that the is like inherent and kind of in a marginalized identity experiencing um, the world that we live in now. Um, so I uh, had a wonderful time, um, yeah, kind of uh, learning his art practice, getting um, to see into um, the way he thinks. Um, oh, and we can move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so I wanna thank everyone for listening um, and uh, I hope that those who uh, got the opportunity to read the article enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tia, for I think um, providing some in inspiration on how we can go about understanding our community and ourselves um, through textile art today. So I think we have some time left to take maybe one or two questions from the audience. And I, if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to start with um, a question that Kate has shared with us. And, and this is for all three of you. Um, what was the process like going from making objects um, to writing about them? So I think Rebecca and Tia, you can, if you can unmute yourselves. Rebecca, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I find that writing is inspirational. Um, it helps me in my personal practice of making kind of think differently and be more aware of what I may or may not be doing while I'm making, right? Like, what am I thinking about? What am I considering? Um, yeah, it's kind of just made me a little bit more thoughtful about that. Um, it's also just opened me up to a lot of different practices. I'm a very dedicated steel worker, right? You know, I just work with steel. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. um, so like, you know, being able to kind of see it kind of brings me out of my own kind of material and flexibility. So I don't know if Tia wants to respond as well. Yeah, I think it was like interesting um, going from kind of maker to observer, but I think that I used my understanding of myself as a maker, um, to help me kind of see into what Alex was creating and offering in the space. So it was, it was, I think a lovely experience to like change my perspective, um, but uh, uh, being a maker always informs um, how and why I write and for who, so great. And I'll and Kate, follow oh, up on that super quick that um, mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, artists super appreciate it when it's a maker who's writing about them because of the connection that Tia mentions. They're like, oh, you kind of get it, right? They don't have mm -hmm. to explain material process, for example, so yeah. Absolutely. 
Uh, Kate, I know you mentioned a little bit about this in your presentation, but I wanted to give you an opportunity if you had anything else to add in your in your thoughts. Uh, yeah, um, I, making, you know, writing and having it out there for the first time was a bit terrifying, like putting art out there for the first time. Sure. Um, there also is like a distinct editing end <laughs> that has to that has to happen, um, which I think I can obscure a little bit more as I reinterpret pieces for future future exhibition and objects. Um, for me, um, I, I think there's a time and place for um, for allegory and formal interpretation and poetics, but uh, writing informatively about research has made me, and I'm very thankful for this, like be as clear as possible. Um, and uh, articulate things in a way so as many people as possible can understand them, um, which is a new way of writing and creating for me. But I've been very grateful because it has helped me, um, you know, learn more about my own my own values and um, commit to them. And I like that a lot. Uh, but like what Tia said, I think I'm a maker first always. But I think the the poetics of that do make it into the writing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think. Um... This issue does a really great job at, um, like, Tia, yeah, I really love what you said, going from maker to observer. And I feel like this issue does a really great job of that, you know, giving us the opportunity to think about our worlds in different ways. So we probably have time for one more uh, quick question. And uh, this one was uh, offered up by Tia. And I wondered if each of you could touch just briefly on this. Um, so how does your artistic practice relate to your understanding of the idea of gender and of yours as well. So Kate, since you're on screen for me, do you want to respond first? <laughs> Absolutely. Now everyone's own interpretation of their gender is theirs and theirs alone. I want to preface Absolutely. that. For me, um, that rejection of binaries, of art and craft, of shame and pride and male and female, uh, it bleeds into every part of my creative and, and self-actualization. Um, and a lot of that is is from years of trying to force myself into one of those binaries or the other, and that didn't work for me. <laughs> um, and so that is how it plays. Um, it, it's this um, just messy constellation of continually unfolding. Um, and um, each day I try and do a little bit better at understanding it and enjoying it while I while I have it. Great. Thank you. Tia or Rebecca? Tia, would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, I love talking and thinking about gender. I, I'm really bad at gender and I try to be worse at it every day um, <laughs> because uh, I, I find it fascinating. I find um, the idea that even though we have this thing that we kind of all can acknowledge by now that is like kind of made up, um, there are elements of it we can like take and enjoy and there are elements of it that we can reject and there are elements of it that we can like combine um, to turn it into something like so new. Um, and yeah, just as Kate was saying that it's it's such a personal experience. Um, and so we can make it whatever we want. Um, I, I find that beautiful. And I think that that is art. I think gender like just is um, an artistic practice, like performing it. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll just share that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit older. So there was a lot less of this opportunity to play when I was younger. And so I often when, um, uh, you know, requested to add extra labels to my identity use gender nonconforming, because for me coming up, especially as an artist, it was really mm -hmm an active re rejection and refusal of what I was being told I should be. Um, and yeah, just to, to echo the, the, the uniqueness of it for people and, you know, the way that gender looks in different places and in different cultures and different um, subgroups, you know, it's just, it's like infinite and it's wonderful. So um, yeah. Thank you. So the, does anybody have, so there are two um, quick direct questions that we probably have, we can address these real quick. Um, the first one, Kate, it, it asks, what is a broom squire? Uh, can handle that one. A broom squire is a person who makes brooms. Okay. And it used to be um, a 
part of that traditional guild system. Usually it was something like after apprenticing, you would have to make brooms for five years um, to be considered a broom squire. Yeah. Right. And then quick follow-up, sorry, I also asked what broom corn was. And um, just a lot of people have asked me as an editor, like, why are brooms in this magazine? And I'm like, well, why not? So <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Kate. <laughs> okay. Would you, uh, should I answer that? Uh, okay, so broom corn is sorghum uh, vulgare. It's um, a, the plant that is predominantly made, uh, used to make brooms in the United States. Um, there's another variation, sorghum bicolor, which is very popular in Europe. Uh, it is not um, an indigenous plant to the United States. Uh, there, um, it is um, a plant that is from Southeast Asia and Northern Africa. And so mm -hmm. while we don't have a very clear tracing of uh, the arrival of broom corn in the United States uh, because of some histories being prioritized over others, um, it's long been suspected that it was brought over by enslaved Africans. Um, it's a food staple in Southeast Asia, um, but has been used to do broom and broom like, um, make broom and broom like tools for a very long time. That's great. Yeah, there's no better place for an article about broom making than the journal. So thank you so much. And then Tia, real quick, someone wants to know if your uh, undergraduate thesis is publicly available. It is not. It isn't. It is under the Stanford paywall. But if anybody who has a Stanford email wants me to drop them the link, I so can. <laughs> Great. I'm sorry that we have to um, end here. Um, Rebecca, I didn't know in the two minutes left if you had any closing thoughts that you wanted to offer. I just wanted to say how grateful I am to have had this opportunity to collaborate with you and everyone here today um, on this journal. And I've uh, just learned so much from the process as well. Yeah, um, same, same. And I'll just quickly say um, it's been uh, an amazing learning experience to learn more about the field of textiles and to be able to connect with all these amazing writers and artists. And um, I'm really grateful um, that the NEA supported this um, project with a grant. That's a pretty big deal. And I forgot to mention that in my uh, talk. Um, so, but yeah, it's just pretty amazing. So thanks everybody. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for joining us in support today. Um, thank you to our presenters and our collaborators. And as Rebecca said, thank you very much to the National Endowment for the Arts for recognizing the hard work that has gone into this issue and the hard work of everybody here. And I would like to ask you um, if you can complete the survey at the end that will be shared. Um, it's really um, helpful for us to um, understand the communities that we've reached today through today's talk. And so Lucy um, can maybe give a quick heads up of how that survey is gonna be able to reach you. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to Rebecca, Kate and Tia today as well. Yep, uh, the survey should pop up on your screen as soon as this webinar ends. So thank you all so much for being here. And um, now I'm just going to play a quick thank you to our sponsors. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.